So what do you, what do you actually have in the barrels? Just uh, you got whiskey, you got some other things going on in there? These are whis- empty whiskey barrels that were taken to a brewery in Chicago. They're going to fill them with beer. Everybody's doing some crazy things with barrels nowadays because, yeah, it's like you're giving to the beer and then like once they're done with the beer, they might give them back to you and then you'll put some other kind of like whiskey but it can't be called a bourbon in it or all this other kind of stuff. Everybody's just doing something different nowadays. Yeah, we just did one of those projects uh, with Bent River Brewing in uh, Rock Island, Illinois. They have a, a coffee stout that they call Uncommon Stout. And they took the barrels, aged the stout, released it, gave the barrels back to us. We put our Cody Road bourbon in it, aged it for another six months, and called it Cody Road Double Barrel. Hey everyone, this was a big week as all the fellows from the Bourbon Community Roundtable came into Louisville for two days of drinking and barrel picking. We had lots of good conversations about working closer together in the upcoming months and how we can bring more content. With that being said, if you're a supporter of the podcast on Patreon, be on the lookout for a message soon about reserving your bottle from this barrel pick. There's not going to be enough to go around, but we wanted to make it as fair as possible. Hats off to everyone at Buffalo Trace for accommodating us And you can expect to see a video compiled of the pick as well from our new friend Jerry over at PerfectPoorTV.com. Also, special thanks to Brent Elliott of Four Roses, who invited us out to come just hang out in the Four Roses lab and drink some samples of stuff that he had pulled from multiple warehouses with a lot of varied age ranges. We hope you're able to follow along if you're following Bourboner, Breaking Bourbon, or us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For this episode, we touch more on the fascination with boutique whiskeys And this one is no exception. Mississippi River Distilling is doing some great things as they're teaming up with other distillers to create some new expressions for the market. If you enjoy the grain to glass story, then you're gonna love this episode. So make sure you support the show on Patreon, make sure you're subscribing on iTunes, YouTube, and Facebook, and make sure you enjoy this week's episode. Ed Bly and Rising Tide Spirits are back again with a new release of Old Stubborn Bourbon. And this release of Old Stubborn is a premium hand marriage of 10, 11, and 12-year cask drink, barely filtered pot still bourbon. It comes in at a staggering 123.8 proof. And the flavoring grain for this one, which the last one was weeded, but this time it's now rye. Rich, sweet, and bold with a long finish that's sure to be another eye-opener. You can order online at Sealbox or thebourbonconcierge.com and you can even purchase in person at Revival Vintage Spirits and even now with very few select stores in Kentucky. You can get it now while you can, but be sure to do it because it's not going to last long. Always find what you love at Total Wine & More. With so many great bottles to choose from at the lowest price, it's easy to find your favorite Cabernet or a new single barrel bourbon to try with some help from one of their friendly guides. And with every bottle comes the confidence of knowing you just found something amazing. With the lowest prices for over 30 years, find what you love and love what you find only at Total Wine & More. Curbside pickup and delivery available in most areas. Visit TotalWine.com to learn more. Spirits not sold in Virginia and North Carolina. Drink responsibly and be 21. Do you ever pour yourself a bourbon, swirl it around, and then start struggling to come up with tasting notes? And perhaps you're also looking for a good Father's Day gift idea. Well, you can now solve both with a kit from Nose Your Bourbon. And unlike other nosing kits on the market, Nose Your Bourbon kits feature real ingredients for the most authentic aromas. You can smell real Tahitian vanilla bean instead of some synthetic aroma that's just made from chemicals. So head on over to noseyourbourbon.com and enter code BP10 for 10% off your order. From their bar to yours, Chad and Sarah of the popular YouTube channel It's Bourbon Night bring you their favorite at-home old-fashioned mix with the new Elemental Elixir's Golden Hour Syrup. It's a custom-made syrup with notes of bold black tea, warm spices, and orange zest. All you need is your favorite whiskey and ice. No bitters needed. One bottle makes 16 drinks, so that's only $1 cocktail before you add your own whiskey. They can also be enjoyed in other cocktails or spirits, mocktails, coffee, tea, and anything you can think of. It's crafted locally in Lexington, Kentucky, and you can get your bottle now at whiskeyambitions.com. 
Play Whiskey Wednesday Round 11, the memory game. Until June 26, each week you can win one of our 12 incredible grand prizes. Select two doors at checkout. And if they match on drawing night, you'll win that bottle. Not a match? No worries. You still score a Weller 12-year. Every $5 ticket gives you five chances to win, including four weekly bonus prizes. Get your tickets now at give270.org. Charitable Gaming License ORG 0002703. Welcome back to the episode of the Burp Pursuit Podcast, the official podcast of bourbon. Just Kenny here, riding solo. Uh, Ryan was supposed to join us today, but we've got another Ryan here as our guest. Uh, and there was just a little bit of a scheduling conflict. Uh, you know, I think it's it's a hard thing that we always try to do. We, we try to try to cram a lot of these recordings at once, and then we get mixed up in time zones. And then when you deal with different people, all these different things happen. But I think uh, today's going to be a, a, a good episode because, you know, we haven't had a, a good representation of craft distillers on lately. So I'm, I'm very happy to actually have another one on and kind of talk about what they're doing, what's unique, uh, the different things that you can get out of what they're building uh, versus what you do when you come to Kentucky and see all the big boys on the bourbon trail. Uh, so today we have one of the master distillers over at the Mississippi River Distilling Company, Ryan Burchett. So Ryan, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks. So glad to be here. Did I butcher your last name at all or was I okay there? No, no, that's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to kind of talk about you for a minute. So kind of talk about just, you know, how you grew up, uh, or is it around spirits or is this just like a crazy idea you had off at a whim? Because I know people are always like, oh, I always wanted to be a bartender in college. So when I grew up, I just opened a bar. <laughs> right. Well, uh, our, our, uh, our story fits a little of both, I guess, in that front and that, uh, my brother and I are partners in this operation, my brother Garrett. And, uh, we, uh, did not have a, a long history in spirits per se, uh, but we did have a history in small business, family business. And my, we grew up, uh, my dad and his three brothers uh, owned a road construction company together. And so all through junior high and then eventually high school and college, uh, we spent working around the family business and, uh, that kind of thing. We didn't realize what we learned about running a family business until after we started our own, but we'd been exposed to that and we're open to it. And, uh, as our careers progressed, we both grew up in Western Iowa, uh, kind of halfway between Omaha, Nebraska, and Des Moines, and uh, rural area. And uh, we were both in other careers. My brother used to design highways. He was living in Dallas, Texas. I was a TV weatherman for 15 years uh, around the country, mainly in Iowa, spent a couple years in Louisiana. And uh, we're back in Iowa and had kind of decided that we wanted to settle down. We're starting to have kids and that kind of thing. And uh, uh, my industry, TV, was a transient business and uh, was kind of sick and tired of moving around. Wanted to be able to raise some kids a little closer to the family and that kind of thing. And so um, it had been illegal in Iowa prior to 2010 to taste or buy spirits at a distiller. You could distill. Uh, but for the tourist side of it was you really weren't going to be able to get it done. And so this uh, law change was potentially out there and we were thinking, wow, this might be a chance to get into the ground level of something really cool and started doing some training, learning more about spirits and how to make them and that kind of thing and writing a business plan, thinking that if the worst thing that ever happened was we learned more about whiskey, well, that was still really cool. And uh, after a couple years of that, the law was changing uh, we had a, a local bank interested, and we figured once a bank was on board, we must have really figured something out. And uh, that was, uh, we opened our distillery, Mississippi River Distilling Company, uh, on the banks of the Mississippi River in a little town called LeClaire, Iowa, which no one's ever heard of unless you watch American Pickers. Uh, we're about three blocks from where they shoot that show. Uh, but we're right outside of Davenport, Iowa, the Quad Cities area. And uh, we opened uh, this week, seven years ago. And... Um, it's uh, it's been a wild ride, and we we geared it towards tourism, uh, kind of taking advantage of that law. We wanted people to be able to come and see how we did it, and then once we decided that we were going to open our doors and and pull back the curtain and let people experience it that way, then we need w needed to make sure that we gave them the opportunity to see it all and to really be authentic about what we do. So. Um, we use local grain sourced from farmers all within 25 miles of our distillery. We mill it on site. We mash it on site. We distill it. We blend it. We bottle it. It all happens at our facility in uh, Little Claire, Iowa. So that's, uh, that's what got us here, I guess. 
So that's real cool. I think, uh, you know, there's one other thing, you know, you talked about LeClaire being pretty small. I remember Davenport being one of my favorite movies of all time. Can you remember what that is? Uh, which one? I don't know. Tommy boy. Do you remember oh. he was, when he goes and he goes, I'm in Davenport, Iowa. You yeah, need a, yeah, yeah. You need, he goes, you need a new map. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> that was, that was one thing that I, that I always remember. Uh, um, but no, I mean, so that's real cool that you, you kind of look at it as, as more of a, you saw an opportunity there, right? So it didn't sound like you had a, you know, being a weatherman, I mean, you came from a, a completely different angle. So I guess kind of talk first about like the weather in Iowa and how that kind of plays a, uh, a key role in this. Right. Because I, I think, I think, you know, we all talk about it in Kentucky. You're like, you're like, Oh, the hot summers, the cold winters, it does this and this, you know, but you're a weatherman, like you, you know exactly <laughs> what's happening here. So I kind of want to get your idea of, the weather in Iowa and how that's playing a, a role into your process as well. Well, I think more specifically than just the weather, our, our climate obviously lends itself really well to growing things like corn. Uh, we have some of the best grain in the world right outside our back door, literally. Um, so uh, that's been the biggest thing is the availability of uh, the grain and that we were able to find it close by we're not trucking it in from timbuktu or anything like that we literally know every one of our farmers by name um we can tell you the field that this stuff came from we can tell you when it was grown you know where it was stored everything about it and so uh you know more than weather has probably influenced it it's been more the the uh, agriculture and the, the industry here but that said we do take a much different approach to an from an aging standpoint and that kind of thing specifically as far as whiskey goes um in that we don't look for the huge temperature swings and that kind of thing we don't uh climate control per se but our aging happens basically underground in a uh, in a bunker that we built that uh holds uh, our whiskey barrels and we try to keep it between about 55 and 75 degrees during the year so there is some swing um, but we're not aging in these big rick houses that are 20 stories tall and things like that and so and we're aging in 30 gallon barrels instead of a 58 gallon barrel things like that and uh, that's been one of the big things that we've tried to help people understand through education of our tours and, and when we're out and about is that you know, when you walk into a room and you set down a bottle of whiskey, if the first question that comes out of your mouth is, how old is it? You really haven't established anything about how that whiskey was made, how it was aged, what happened with it along the way, other than how long did it sit around? And I think that there's a whole lot of other questions that you can ask that's going to peel back the onion and help you understand what makes this bottle different or special or um, uh, out of the ordinary compared to everything else that's on the shelf in front of you. And what's really cool is over the past seven years, as we've been in this industry, we've watched the marketplace go from you're making your own whiskey to uh, tell me more about, uh, you know, are you guys green to glass? Are you this or that? So the consumers and the buyers are becoming much more educated. And I think that it's opening the marketplace to a variety that probably has not been seen in the United States uh, prior to right now. Yeah. I mean, I, I thought it was really interesting when you said that, you know, you, you know, I, I think I'm trying to figure out the best way to say this because, you know, we've got a lot of, a lot of people that are very keen to saying like, Oh, they love to see an age statement in a bottle and stuff like that. And then you also kind of flipped it and you said, you know, the way that you age your barrels is in a basically it's underground it's almost temperature regulated if anybody's ever been to a cave that's kind of how it really works and the real interesting thing to this is that when you get into older higher age whiskeys whether they're in the 20 plus year category most of these whiskeys are the ones that are actually in the middle of the warehouse where they don't see a huge or a lot of, uh, of those temperature fluctuations, right? So there's, that's why they actually have whiskey still left in the barrel to actually bottle at that point. So I think it's a really unique uh, way that you could be looking at kind of creating a, I mean, the way I look at it is I don't want to say hyper aging, but it, it could be looking at uh, something that could be relatively close to something that is older because it's not hitting those temperature fluctuations, but it's sitting in a, in a warehouse that's been, been there for a while. And not only that is, you know, using a, a smaller barrel size, uh, tries to relieve, uh, and, you know, kind of make that difference as well. Right. 
<laughs> yeah, it does. It's a it's a it's a different way of doing it, and I think that's what our challenge has been from a craft standpoint is helping people to understand. And I liken it to, you know, when craft beer came along 20, 25 years ago, you know, you had light beer out there and, and Budweiser and Bud Light or whatever, Miller Light. And, you know, uh, Sam Adams came along and they said, drink better beer. And they were right because it had flavor and it was big and it was different. And from craft spirits, I'm not going to walk into the room and look you in the eye and say, don't drink Woodford Reserve because that stuff is garbage. You know, it's ridiculous. It's not the case. But what I will tell you is that 90 plus percent of America's whiskey is made in virtually the same fashion, in a similar still, in a similar, you know, in a tradition that is has been the same way for a really long time. They make really, really good spirits. I like to drink them too. But what craft is bringing to the table is a different approach that's going to bring you different flavors and different ways to experience some of these familiar familiarities from a spirit that you haven't before. And that's what we're trying to do. You know, if 20 years ago you put an IPA in front of somebody, they would have spit it out through their nose. Like, what in the hell is this garbage, you know? But people's tastes have been uh, broadened uh, to a point now that some of these, you know, out of the ordinary flavors are mainstream again. And so what I think is exciting about craft is that we are opening a book to what is probably more akin to the way that spirits were made in this country, uh, you know, 80, 90, hundred years ago. And that's our approach at Mississippi river distilling with our Cody road whiskeys. We do age in a 30 gallon cask and our stuff is about two years old. But what we do differently is uh, we, we take an, a, a very European approach to our distillation method, and that is uh, we trained in Germany with the company that built our still, and uh, we push the proof. Uh, like on our bourbon, we're riding right up to 160, so that uh, you know we have as clean of a spirit as possible going into the barrel. It's a small batch approach. It's not a continuous still. It, it's a, a pot still. Um, we run it through a couple plates. And so we have, when we started, we knew we were laying down whiskey. We knew it was a smooth spirit coming off the still. We didn't know what it was going to taste like once it had a couple years under its belt. So, you know, as a, from a business perspective, you're really placing a, a gamble here. But if it's a quality spirit going into the barrel, it's going to be even better coming out of the barrel. So talk about then, that gamble. Talk about that gamble a little bit. I mean, like, as uh, you know, you said, I mean, that's one of the biggest things in craft distilling, right, is you are making a gamble. Uh, right. And kind of talk about, you know, what that is, what the kind of the product has turned into since you've been able to test it out or try it out from your distillation. Well, yeah, when you're when you're running a brewery and you, you make a beer and you put it in a bottle, you sell it. When you're running a distillery and the market is whiskey, we all, <laughs> we all know that. Um, you're putting it in a barrel and you're sitting on it for a couple of years. So I always joke, could we just sit around and, and make some money for a change <laughs> instead of, <laughs> uh, you know, my retirement is sitting in a barrel room downstairs right now. And, um, you know, it's nice now that we've got a few more years under our belt that uh, there's things going into the barrel room, but it's also coming out and you can realize some of that uh, cash flow back into the operation. But it is a, a very cash intensive industry to get into, especially as a small player, uh, to, be able, to be able to make that investment and to hang on with it um, through the years. But, you know, we made some decisions really early on, almost unwittingly. Um, we went into the barrel at a pretty low proof. Our uh, bourbon whiskey goes into the barrel at 110. Our rye goes in at uh, uh, 96 usually. Um, and uh, we bottle the bourbon at 90. We bottle the rye at 80. The reason we did that is because from the beginning, we did not want to add any coloring to the whiskey. And we wanted to make sure that we weren't adding a whole lot of water on the back end. Um, you know, you may or may not people may or may not realize most whiskey goes into the barrel at the legal maximum of 125 and then is watered down after it comes out to get it down to the appropriate bottle proof, you know, usually 80, 90, whatever it might be. Um, by using a lower proof, then we add very little water coming out of the barrel so that we have the color, but almost virtually everything in our bottles has interacted with oak. And uh, if you've messed around with craft spirits much, and people have used five gallon, 10 gallon, 15 gallon barrels, you can get a real astringency out of oak if it's not in balance. 
if uh, it's too much char, not enough of the sugar from the oak, and that kind of thing. And we found that the sugars from the oak dissolve much better in water than they do in alcohol. And at a lower proof, we're getting a nice balance out of that smaller barrel. And in a two-year time frame, what we're finding at 24 to 36 months seems to be the prime spot with these barrels. We've got some barrels. And we're not, uh, we almost like some of the younger whiskey a little bit better. They're a little sweeter and they're in balance. And that, again, I get people who will ask me, well, are you going to have a seven year, a 10 year, something like that? Well, we could do that, but we would have to make the whiskey completely different. It's going to sit in the barrel that long. We need it to have a rougher edge on a a stronger backbone going into the barrel so that it's going to last that long and come out not tasting like toothpicks and that kind of thing. So, Again, it's not as simple as how old is it? It's what proof did it go into the barrel? What proof did it come out of the barrel? What size of barrel did you use? What char of a barrel did you use? All of these different things. And what's really fascinating is you can lay down a spirit made the same day from the same mash tank, you know, the same fermenter, everything, put it in two different barrels and you're going to have two different whiskeys when it comes out. And I think that's one of the really remarkable things that I really appreciate about what goes on in Kentucky and some of these large distilleries is the product consistency that they're able to achieve by blending literally millions of barrels every year and to be able to bring that product to market again and again. uh, So it tastes just the way that you remember it the last time you had it is really remarkable. I think, you know, one thing that you talked about, so you guys do entry at 125 proof. Is that what you said? We go in at 110. Most, 110. most American whiskey does go in at 125. Yeah. I've, I've heard up to 160 at some places too. So I know it could be, it can be up there, but so I, I did I also hear you do a difference in the entry truth between your rye and your bourbon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The so, rye so, goes in even lower. It gets bottled lower. So that we, that's why we started lower there. Well, kind of talk about the, the reasoning behind it of, of why you wanted to go with an entry proof that's a little bit lower. This is actually a question that came from a, a Patreon member who's watching this live right now. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it was, um, it goes back to we wanted to be authentic. And I did not want to, or we need, felt like we needed to add any coloring or anything to it. So when you take a, a, a spirit out of the barrel, and you add 20% water, well, you're going to wash away a lot of your color that way. It's just going to look lighter in the bottle. And so, um, you know, it was, it was from that, that it started that let's make, let's try to be in a situation where we don't have to add much blending water. Now we lose some proof during aging. So you got to come in high so that you have some room for the angel share to come back down. But, um, by doing that and then experimenting later with some other barrel entry proofs, we found very consistently that the lower barrel proofs were giving us a much sweeter, a much more balanced whiskey that, uh, that really worked well for what we were doing. Our bourbon is a weeded bourbon, so it's a little sweeter coming in anyway. Um, and uh, so the, when we messed around with the barrel proof, we found that pushing it up just did not give us as well-rounded of a whiskey, and we stuck with it from the beginning. So talk about the the process that you went through in trying to figure out what your entry proof is going to be and and what your bottling proof is going to be because it sounds like you you had all these experiments that were going on and I know that you can you can taste something off the still and it tastes great uh, and then it can taste bad right and but it was as you had mentioned already as soon as it hits the wood and you age it for three six nine months even uh, two years all that is going to change drastically so kind of talk about your process of what you did in you know really honing in and and figuring out what is it that you guys are going to try to make a consistent product out of well i'd love to tell you that i was some kind of a genius from the beginning and i had us all figured out and we just knew exactly what we were going for um unfortunately as my wife will tell you i am not a genius but uh (laughs) what don't worry it doesn't matter who you're married to i I, I get it as well yeah (laughs) right right (laughs) Uh, she's way cooler than me. Don't take me wrong. But um, anyway, the the low barrel proof we started with, when we came out with even some of our early on, you know, just kind of experimenting, let's get into this barrel a little bit. We found early on that we liked those barrels better. Um, what we, as we went forward to a point that we were getting ready to release some whiskey and we released some whiskey at about between 12 and 15 months, five plus years ago when we first got started. Um, we found that proof at 80 on the bourbon, 
that was going in at 110, and it was coming out about 106, 107 after a year. Um, we were found out that it was like it was just almost too mild at 80 proof. We you put a couple ice cubes in it, and it was like where was the whiskey? It just it didn't have enough backbone in it, and so we bumped it up to 90 proof for our bottling at the very beginning. And uh, that just gave it a, a, enough spine that, you know, it could hold up to a couple drops of water, hold up to some ice cubes. Now, our, our whiskeys, when we first came out with them, were obviously very grain forward at that younger age. But we liked them and they were different and uh, we got a pretty good response. They're very smooth and clean in the way that we distill them. And now as we've gone forward, uh, we just kind of, well, we stuck with that just because that's that's what we had on our label and that kind of thing. But it's worked out really well. Um I'm pleased with the bourbon at 90. And the flip side of that is our rye, we go at a lower proof, at 80 proof, because our rye is much more akin to, a, I'd say, a full-flavored Canadian whiskey than a typical American rye that's going to be really big and spicy. Ours is very clean, light. You find some fruit notes in rye that you're just not going to find elsewhere. It's got some apple, banana, uh, pear, and then the spice just kind of lingers in the back. And we Again, we're trying to go for a style and a flavor that was going to be different than everything else on the shelf. As he, as a small guy, um, you know, you you kind of have a, a choice to make. Am I going to try to be something that everybody is going to be familiar with and they're going to want to buy a lot of it, or am I going to try to take a different tack to the marketplace and provide something that is different than all these other bottles over here? And that's kind of the the. Uh, way we went with it. And so for the rye, it worked much better to bring out those sweet flavors, those fruit flavors at a lower proof than it did at a higher proof. So those two spirits kind of evolved differently in that way. You know, we've, we've talked about your process a lot and I don't think we've gotten you the, uh, the ability to kind of talk about your product. So, you know, you, you mentioned Cody road, uh, you mentioned your rye and your bourbon, but you guys do more than that there. So I want you to give an opportunity to kind of talk about, uh, the different product sets that you guys have available to you and, and what you are distilling. If you're anything like me, then you can't get enough about bourbon. And that's why I'm a subscriber to Bourbon Plus magazine. Bourbon Plus is a quarterly publication that tells the stories from the heart of bourbon, the farmers who grow the grain, the distillers who labor over the process, and the people like you and me who raise their glasses to celebrate it all. Subscribe to Bourbon Plus magazine today at bourbonplus.com, that's P-L-U-S dot com, and use code PURSUIT at checkout for $5 off your subscription. Shopify's already taken the cash register online, helping millions sell billions around the world. But did you know that Shopify can do the same thing at your retail store? Give your point of sale system a serious upgrade with Shopify. Shopify's point of sale is your command center for your retail store. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify has everything you need to sell in person. And with Shopify, you get a powerhouse selling partner that effortlessly unites your in-person and online sales into one source of truth. Track every sale across your business in one place and know exactly what's in stock. Connect with customers in line and online. Shopify helps you drive store traffic with plug and play tools built for marketing campaigns from TikTok to Instagram and beyond. And get hardware that fits your business. Take payments by smartphone, transform your tablet into a point of sale system, or use Shopify's point of sale Go Mobile device for a battle tested solution. Plus, Shopify's award-winning 24-7 help is there to support your success every step of the way. Do retail right with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash bourbon, all lowercase, and go to shopify.com slash bourbon to take your retail business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash bourbon. You know, we've we've talked about your process a lot, and I don't think we've gotten you the uh, the ability to kind of talk about your product. So, you know, you, you mentioned Cody Road, uh, you mentioned your rye and your bourbon, but you guys do more than that there. So, I want you to give an opportunity to kind of talk about uh, the different product sets that you guys have available to you and, and what you are distilling. Right. Well, uh, because we started off as a kind of a tourist uh, opportunity for folks, um, that meant we kind of need to have a little bit of everything for people to come and try and, and to see. And we, um, so we started off, we were making whiskey, but that was going into barrels obviously. And so we had to have something to sell in the meantime. So we started off with vodka, gin, um, 
uh, tying to the history of the river. It's Cody Road, the name comes from Buffalo Bill Cody, was born just a few blocks from our distillery, and the distillery sits on Cody Road. We couldn't trademark Buffalo Bill's name, so we went with Cody Road, um, and uh, that worked out well. But um, the uh, the other stuff we kind of tied to the history, we have our River Pilot Vodka, River Rose Gin, uh, and a River Baron Artisan Spirit. Uh, what the heck is an artisan spirit? People ask me all the time. This is kind of that's what I was going to say. I was yeah. like, I, I, looked, I looked at the website and I was like, I don't think I've heard of artisan spirit before, right? So uh, it's kind of a funny story. It was, um, it's kind of our take on an unaged whiskey, a white whiskey, but we just pushed the proof on it all the way up uh, to vodka proof. We're distilling it at 190. Uh, but whereas a vodka would get distilled, charcoal filtered, redistilled to chase off all the flavor of the grain. We're distilling it once and then stopping. So it keeps that sweet vanilla butterscotch taste from corn and wheat, but it um, it's smooth like a vodka. So when we went to the CTB with it, they were like, well, you can't call this vodka because it's not odorless and flavorless. You can't call it flavored vodka because no flavor is added and occurred naturally. You can't call it whiskey, a white whiskey, because it's distilled at too high a proof. So we went round and round and finally, uh, well, what can we call it? Well, you can call it alcohol distilled from grain. Well, great. Everyone thinks we're selling Everclear now, you know? Yeah. And so uh, they're like, well, it's a distilled spirit specialty, so you can give it a fanciful name. And so we call it an artisan spirit. To and be you honest said, with you, is that bottled at 190 as well? No, 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 no. We bottle it at 80 proof, but we okay. still it at 190. So that's how we get the clean, you know, smoothness to it. Um, but what we sell a lot of it at the distillery. Once people hear what it is and try it, um, they really like it. It's a hard product to sell out in the marketplace, obviously, because it's, uh, you, you don't know what it is right off. But what we find is, you know, like if I'm having a, a vodka tonic or a martini, then I want a traditional neutral vodka. And we do that with the river pilot. If we're having, Mixing it with something, you know, some fruit juice, something like that, even in a Bloody Mary or something, there's a flavor there with that spirit in the background that you can bring through in a cocktail instead of just having it disappear. And so uh, that one I like that way. Our gin, uh, River Rose, comes from a, an old German recipe. The guys in Germany we consulted with on most of our recipes, they found it in an old German textbook from the late 1800s. We told them we wanted a, a gin that was in the style lighter on juniper and and uh you know maybe some different botanicals something off the beaten path and uh they said well we found this one i think you'll like it and it has a lot of citrus to it um a lot of floral has rose petal lavender cucumbers and um so it's more in the vein of an american style gin the what than the traditional london dry and then uh we've taken a a tact of developing some kind of one-off products here and there. We call them seasonals, um, where we find a local ingredient and we try to figure out something cool to do with it. And then we might release, you know, anywhere from a couple hundred to a couple thousand bottles. And when they're gone, they're gone. Usually we take them through the local marketplace in Iowa and Illinois and kind of uh, sometimes a little bit farther than that, but that's where most of it goes. But it's led us to like, we do a coffee liqueur this time of year year with a local coffee roaster we do a honey infused bourbon with a local beekeeper we do a maple infused bourbon with a, a local guy that has maple trees so i thought um, you're gonna say man, just a canadian around here that we use him for right yeah you know they, it's a it's a <laughs> funny story of the river real quickly of a guy he has uh 500 acres that were i think it's his third or fourth generation of his family but his grandfather sold off all the oak trees uh 100 years ago because they would float down the river the maple trees would not float. And so he basically cleared all of the acreage of uh, oak trees. And now all they have left is maple trees. Well, next thing, now he's got a family business of uh, tapping the maple trees. So it's been kind of funny. <laughs> that is interesting. You know, I think it's funny that you, you, not really funny, but I think it's a good business move to talk about the different types of the seasonals that you do. I mean, like right now is a great time of people that go out and get something that's coffee based because it's getting a little bit colder. When you get in the springtime, I mean, that honey is right there. It's perfect for making things like a gold rush or uh, any of those kind of cocktails that that do that. Now, with all your distilled spirits, are are you using grain to glass on all these as well? All of the alcohol is made from 
grain sourced from farmers within 25 miles of the place. And we put a little batch sticker on the side, and you can cross-reference that on our website with the batch notes for your bottle, and it'll tell you that the corn was grown by Ryan and Dan Clark of LeClaire, Iowa, and the wheat was grown by uh, Tony Kenobi in uh, Davenport, Iowa, and uh, uh, the uh, Weary Brothers in Fulton, Illinois, that kind of stuff. It's all uh, – we we're – really trying to showcase the fact that it is truly local. And we found that that chain of ingredients is as important to a consumer in Davenport, Iowa, as it is to a consumer in Chicago, Illinois, or Dallas, Texas, or Minneapolis, or New York City. Even though it might not be local to them specifically, the fact that we're accountable for what's going into our bottles is really a huge selling point for us. I mean, you look at that, I look at it with a very high level transparency, right? And saying mm-hmm. that, you know, you are, you're, you're standing behind almost everything from the grain to uh, the still spirit to everything, right? So you're standing behind uh, the farmers that are locally growing it. You're standing behind the product in itself. Um, you know, one of the things that, you know, I kind of want to get your take on this is, you know, we have, we have, we talked a lot of the big guys, right? And so grain mm-hmm. to glass is something you hear very common in uh, the craft movement. However, the, the bigger ones don't necessarily see it that way. They, they say, like, you know, we want to source basically as much grain as possible. It doesn't care where they come from as long as they have a good, high-quality product. Um, but when I look at what you're doing, you're doing something that also stimulates the local economy around you as well. So kind of talk about, like, your idea, the thought process of doing the grain to glass versus just doing, well, let's just go source everything, doesn't matter where it comes from. Right. Well, I think it's – the difference of a craft product, what the consumer is looking for in that product is, um, is different than what they expect from a a mass produced product. And I think that number one, you're looking for a way to differentiate yourself, but we grew up, our, our business grew up during a time when most of the whiskey that was on the market in the craft industry was sourced whiskey. You know, it was being distilled at another distillery, brought in, put a different label on it. And we said, we want to stand out somebody that is doing it differently. We want to stand out as an authentic craft distillery from the very beginning. And, we, you know, if you go to our website right now, it says that right on the front. We've kind of used that as a tagline. We want to be authentic. Be who you say you are. And I think that for some of the people in craft that have gotten in a little bit of trouble for some of this stuff, if if they would have just done that from the beginning, they'd be fine. There's plenty of room in the marketplace for all different ways of skinning the cat, but be authentic about who you are. And we wanted to do that. And we grew live in a place in Iowa that is so rich in agriculture and in history surrounding that, that we're like, let's take advantage of that. Let's be a part of what is happening around us, and that is a lot of cornfields, but there's a, a lot of people who uh, make their living in in that, and we thought it was a way to try to tie to the authenticity of the place that we're from. You know, we're from a lot of cornfields, so we're going to make spirits out of corn, and, um, you know, we, uh, we have some t-shirts in the gift shop and stuff that say, like our stuff, thank a farmer, and we really want to be a part of the history and the economy of the place that we're from that is uniquely Iowan. And so we've tried to do that in everything that we've set off to do. So talk a little bit about what the, I guess you could say that the consumer rises and popularity of uh, either bourbon or distilled spirits in, in your part of the country, right? I mean, I know that it's kind of exploding everywhere, but you know, we don't hear, I mean, I think you're easily our first guest, I think that's been on from Iowa, right? So kind of talk about what's happening, you know, in the Midwest. Well, um, I think that uh, when we started five, seven years ago now, we were right in the middle of that flavored vodka craze. And the, the volume that you saw going on around you of all these flavors and that kind of thing was just crazy. What I have really noticed, and it's it's everywhere, but I think the market's really changed here is people's willingness to pay for a little bit better quality product. Um, I think, uh, whereas before, if you ran across a whiskey drinker in this neck of the woods, they were probably drinking Jack or Jim or, you know, whatever, mixing it with Coke and, and whatnot. What's really changing is the palate of the younger consumer. And I'm going to say, you know, that 
30 to 40 year old that maybe hadn't gotten into spirits yet, you know, 15 to 20 years ago, not that, I mean, that age of consumer when, you know, 15, 20 years ago, um, that demographic may have skewed much more beer and that kind of thing. It seems like we're seeing a lot more young people that are taking to spirits. They're taking to quality spirits and they're much more adventurous than even in recent years. Um, you know, people will go out to a bar, they might have a glass of wine with dinner, then they might have a, a craft beer and then they might have a, a, a cocktail and then they might go back and have more wine. Who knows? They're not as tremendously brand loyal as generations before us, um, you know, where there was a guy who drank Jack and Coke every day of his life for 65 years. Um, but I think that that, um, that adventurous attitude is beneficial, certainly to craft. Uh, you know, I don't see other craft producers necessarily as a huge competitor to us as much as I want people to give something different a chance to be more adventurous because if you're going to go do that, if you're going to go try a craft product and you like it, then the next bottle you buy will be mine, but the next bottle might be his. But if we all are doing this and changing people's palates, um, and I think it, it will benefit everybody in the game. So, uh, you know, you kind of mentioned that not other crafts are really like you really seem as competitors. You guys are kind of all in this together. Um, and not only that is because a lot of the the craft distillers and the craft movements out there, you know, they don't have national distribution or anything like that. So I want to give you the opportunity to talk to our listeners of of where you're distributed at, what states can they find your products, everything like that. Yeah, um, it's uh, we're obviously primarily in the Midwest. Um, we do well, Iowa, Illinois, Minnesota, Wisconsin. Kansas, Missouri, uh, Indiana. Um, and then outside of that, uh, Texas is a good state for us. Uh, Specs has gotten behind our products. If anybody's uh, from Texas, they've heard of the chain of liquor store Specs, an independent set of stores. Um, if you're in the Chicago area, Benny's carries our products. Um, we're in New York City um, is a good market for us. Uh, Washington, D.C., Baltimore area. So, uh, you know, we're in about 20 states right now. Um, and so it's kind of hit and miss. We're just getting, putting the finishing touches on. We're partnering with a liquor store out of the Twin Cities to kind of uh, provide for an online store for us as, uh, you know, more and more people are trying to find us in between and it's not quite up and running, but hopefully any day now. Um, but uh, that distribution is, is a real challenge for the small guys. And, you know, as a lot of consumers may not realize what's happening in the landscape of distribution right now. Um, about a year ago, you had Southern Wine and Spirits and Glazers uh, combine and then uh, become one of the largest uh, coast-to-coast -coast distributors in the country. And then just recently, within the last few weeks, uh, Breakthrough Beverage, which was a combination of Wurtz Beverage in Chicago and Charmer Sunbelt up in the Northeast, they just uh, reached an agreement to uh, combine with Republic National Distributing Company, which is strong in the South and things. So there's kind of this, uh, this consolidation amongst the distribution tier that um, the, the big guys are getting bigger, and it's um, not, I'm not saying that's necessarily bad for the industry, but it's definitely going to change the industry in how some of these smaller spirits like ours get to the marketplace. In some markets, we work with very small distributors and others like Chicago, we work with a breakthrough. We're, we're a part of their craft portfolio. They do very well for us, but it's, um, it's going to be really interesting to see how things change over the next few years as some of these big guys continue to get bigger and what, how does that next tier of distribution kind of fall in line um, with some of the medium sized to smaller sized brands that are out there and how do they get to the marketplace? Yeah. You, you said the bigger guys are getting bigger. I think they usually call those monopolies, but we'll see what happens. Right. <laughs> I didn't say that. I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I'll put, I'll put myself on the line. So. <laughs> Uh, so the other thing, you, you know, you said you started this operation around five to seven years ago. So kind of talk about the growth of your business uh, and and just the distillation and the the amount of equipment, the amount of barrels, the aging process, everything that's happened like from the beginning until uh, today. It's kind of comical because this is this week is our anniversary, and it seems like whenever this rolls around, you start really thinking back to 
how you got started and what this place looked like, uh, you know, five years ago, seven years ago, that kind of thing. And um, we've really grown uh, exponentially just within the last couple of years. We've tripled our brewing capacity in the distillery, but a uh, new ferment went from three fermenters to six fermenters. They were 500 gallons. Now we bought six 1500 gallon fermenters. Um, we've gone from a 500 gallon mash tank to a 1500 gallon mash tank. We found was spending our money to make more product to send through the still uh, would get us more product in hand than just having a still that, uh, you know, we could run longer. Um, The thing about a bigger still is it's going to distill at the same speed. It's just that you don't have to fill it up as many times. So um, it uh, we're still using the same still. Um, But it's, uh, you know, we started off with we thought we were excited to have you know, the first 20 barrels laid down. And now we have uh, almost 900 barrels sitting downstairs waiting for the sun to come up every day. So, and uh, plans to continue to grow that. It's, um, it, 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 we've gotten to a point from a business standpoint of enough capital running through the operation that there's enough reinvestment available to be able to really take a big step forward as far as what we're laying down. And what we'd like to do next year is to be able to lay down three to four years worth of whiskey so that everything that we put down um, is collectively getting older and higher quality and all that stuff is happening together. We haven't taken the, the uh, tact of, okay, we're going to have this stack of barrels that's going to be 10 years old or whatever, because there's really no chance to make a huge difference in the marketplace with just a little bit. Of, it's to constantly improve the quality of the product that we're putting in the bottle. I don't think somebody that picked up a bottle last January and picks one up this January is going to notice a sizable difference. I think if you lined them up over time, I would hope that you'd notice, oh, this is getting a little smoother. This is more balanced. I like this a little bit better than that. But that the, with the extra age, that the quality is, is slowly evolving and, and uh, getting better and better every day. And that's what we've tried to do is just uh, – Learn from the mistakes that we make, um, learn from even some of the successes that we have to every day try to improve upon it in some way, a little bit here, a little bit there. Maybe it's in our yields and our fermentation. Maybe it's in the way we distill and what we're getting out of this or that or um, what we're using uh, for water, what we're using for grain, those kind of things tweaking with it, experimenting, trying a different barrel here or there, setting those back, seeing how they go so that your knowledge base and your experience base is always expanding and putting yourself in a position to uh, continue to bring something unique and better to the marketplace every day. So what was your, that moment, right? When, when you, you know, you had your distillery up and running and you tried a few things and we've all been it there. We all, you know, you're easily considered a startup, right? And at maybe it's six months or a year in, maybe two years in, you thought like we're in over our head, like what were we thinking, right? <laughs> but when was that point when you said, this is like, we're, we're onto something good here, right? Like, let's keep going. Yeah. Um, the, the, one, the, the first year is an absolute blur. Um, <laughs> It's kind of like, like having your, it's like having your first kid, right? Yeah. I was just going to say that you don't sleep, you don't, you know, it's like, it's probably best I don't remember it all because it was so crazy. But um when we released Cody Road Bourbon for the first time, um we had made an announcement, you know, on just on our Facebook page and our newsletter and whatever, we we're going to have the first batch available. And it was not long before Christmas and um I guess I was stupid to think that people wouldn't be excited about it. I, I, I guess I didn't, wasn't that I didn't think people excited would be excited about it. I was not prepared to park my car and come around the corner to see people lined up almost two blocks down the street to pick up a bottle of our first bourbon. And that was like, wow, we, we, we've, we got something here. And, um, I guess they hadn't tried it yet, so it could have been terrible, but the, the, <laughs> the, the community, the it's the local marketplace has been so good to us from the very beginning. And, and days like that stand out in my memory of like uh, where where you really get to share with the the people that have that have put you here and the you know the people that have had your back from the very beginning. That was an exciting day. Um, and uh, here this week on Thursday, we'll be releasing our anniversary. We always take an old barrel and, and bottle it uh, special for our anniversary. So it'll be a five-year-old. It's our seventh anniversary, but the whiskey is five years old. And this will be the oldest whiskey that we've um, 
uh, sold. And so we're going to have a, a night in the, in the bar, our new bar. They just changed the law in Iowa so we can sell by the glass. So, um, Garrett and I will be signing bottles and celebrating with the folks that, that got us here and, and, uh, see how the five-year taste. So. Well, good. So I'm, I'm sure that the, the gradual progression of the two, three, four, five is exactly what you anticipated, uh, in <laughs> regards of the, in regards to the, the maturing process. It, you know, it. I, I'm always amazed at the effect of wood um, and how I mentioned earlier how one barrel can vary from another barrel. We typically blend eight barrels for product consistency sake, but our single barrel projects never cease to amaze me. And to um, our anniversary barrel last year was a sister barrel to this one. It was four years old last year, and now this one's five years old. Um, but they're very different. The last year's was much sweeter. This one uh, is seems to have a more more of a oak flavor and uh it's just uh i think that that barrel experimentation is kind of the next frontier for craft i think there's so much fun cool things to do with wood that can really put a twist on a whiskey that might not expect and so that's that's coming down the pipe we're working on we have a project we do every year um for chicago's whiskey fest um, we get together with few spirits out of Evanston, journeyman distilling from three Oaks, Michigan and Corsair from Nashville. Each of us contribute 30 gallons of whiskey. They send it to us in LeClaire. We blend it, let it marry, put it back in the barrels and then uh, release it. We've done a, a bourbon, a rye, uh, a malt whiskey. And then we did a blended whiskey where it was, dip- everybody did a different grain. This year we're doing bourbon again, but we put it into used tequila barrels. And so that will release in Chicago coming up in, uh, I guess whiskey fest is coming up in March. Um, I mean, so you so really think be- that, I mean, we had talked about this before, right? Because anybody yeah. that's, that's not, uh, they're just listening right now. You don't get to see that, uh, Ryan's actually in his car and he's got four whiskey barrels <laughs> in the, right. literally behind him that he's taken to a brewery to go and make, uh, you know, basically barrel age something. And then, you know, we, and you, we talked about before that and you had mentioned that there's a lot of cool things you can do with wood, and, and the different ways that you can put out a product. And, you know, it's, it's always, you always see that a lot with beer. You don't see it too much with bourbon. So it's going to be exciting to kind of see which, not necessarily bourbon, but you're essentially a whiskey at that point. But it's going to be really interesting to see what are those, what are those experiments going to come out as. Right. And, and you know, it's, uh, it's not, for the bourbon purist, it's not going to provide the flavors that you're looking for. And we get that. But again, going back to craft, trying to provide something different i think that um the the vibrancy of the oak used to make bourbon you know you're always using a new charred barrel um gives you great product consistency but it uh also it's it hides some of the nuances of of the base spirit so to take an aged spirit put it back into a used barrel you start getting to that world of scotch of you know well, what was this finished in a sherry cask? Was this finished in a, a used rum barrel? Something like that. And it really can put a twist on a familiar spirit in a new way. And I think that experimenting with barrel sizes, old uh, different barrels, you know, aging in one barrel, finishing in another, those kind of things um, are a way to take a quality familiar spirit and make it totally new again in a different way that, um, that I think craft will bring to the marketplace just because, you know, we have the ability to go throw a couple barrels into a tequila cask and say, let's see how this goes. So, you know, um, I, I certainly wouldn't apologize for that, uh, in the marketplace. I think you'll see more and more of it and, uh, hopefully, uh, just be a, a new, a, a new kind of vein of whiskey that, uh, we probably haven't even thought of yet. And I, I really thought it was interesting there, you know, your, your collaboration for Whiskey Fest. You know, you see that in craft beer world all the time. You see breweries that collaborate on different things, but you don't hear too much about it in the whiskey world, right? And it's because whether they don't want to share or whether they're like, oh, it's my yeast, like stay away from my yeast. I, I don't really know what it is, right? But it's cool to actually see that happening inside of the, the whiskey realm as well. And, you know, we've been doing this. This will be our fifth collaboration. And to my knowledge, I don't know that anybody else in the country has pulled it off yet to this scale. It's a regulatory Mm -hmm. nightmare to get set up to transfer spirits between distilleries, blend them, bottle them back out, you know, whose licenses go, all that kind of stuff, especially multi-states and all that stuff. But once we got it figured out, then it makes it easier to replicate year to year. So, um, you know, it's been kind of fun to be uh, uh, on the the leading edge of, of some some 
collaboration like that. And I think it's the spirit of craft to work together. Um, so we're really pleased to be a part of it with those three other guys. That's real cool. So uh, while we wrap this up, I got, got one more question that I didn't ask before. Like mm-hmm. we talked about Cody Road, where the name Cody Road came from, but you didn't talk about where the name Mississippi River actually came from, <laughs> or the Mississippi River Distilling Company, right? right? Like, did right. you guys, like I said, did you all like look outside your window and say, oh, there it is. We got our name, right? Yeah. Well, it was funny. We we had a slew of other names that we were working on, and it was another friend in the industry uh, who looked at us and go, are you guys idiots? You, there's a Mississippi River is right there. Why Why wouldn't you use that for your name? Oh yeah, that's. A pretty good idea. <laughs> I I will say in retro, it it's worked for us and against us. It's a very long name, <laughs> you know, to sure. out, that kind of thing. Uh, but uh, we do we do some export business in Germany and Australia. We just sent 200 cases of rye whiskey to Canada to Ontario, which the LCBO is selling, and I think it's really hilarious that uh, Canadians are drinking rye whiskey made in Iowa. Um, <laughs> but it. You know, you can say to someone from Germany or Australia, you, the word Mississippi River, that means something to them. You know, it's a landmark in our country that they, they can associate with. And so uh, sometimes we have trouble getting people to understand that we're from Iowa, not from Mississippi. Uh, but it, uh, it it's literally right out our back door. I look at that river every day. And, uh, you know, right now we've got the eagles moving in for the winter time and things like that. It's gorgeous. Um, it's about, oh, I don't know, hundred yards out of our back door. You can dip your toe in the water. So we literally sit right on the banks of the Mississippi river where I 80, uh, crosses. So between uh, we're right halfway between Chicago and Des Moines. If you're ever driving back and forth there about a mile off the interstate, you got to jump off and see us. So I was about to say, I want, I want you to give everybody information of where they can go. How do they sign up for tours, uh, social media contact, all that good stuff. Yep. Our website is mrdistilling.com. Looks like Mr. Distilling. It stands for Mississippi River, but it's easy <laughs> I to like remember. That. I'm going to take Mr. that Distilling. name, Mr. Distiller. Right? <laughs> um, and uh, we're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all that stuff you can find through there. Um, but uh, we are literally a mile off the interstate as you cross into Iowa from Illinois. Um, exit 306, LeClaire, Iowa. And our tours are free. Uh, we give five free public tours a day, every hour on the hour. First one's at noon, last one's at four o'clock. Uh, we have a cocktail house where we make uh, cocktails with our spirits. It's open late every night, so you can come and have a drink with us. Um, and uh, we sell the bottles on site as well. And uh, we uh, uh, just encourage people to come check it out. We have a brewery next door. We have a winery down the street. Um, the American Pickers are in town. So uh, it is a great small town to come and uh, just experience uh, a little bit of Americana in a whole new way and uh, have a little to drink while you're at it. (laughs) And say, get drunk and take home some antiques, I guess, right? That too, that too, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Well, cool. Well, Ryan, I just want to say thank you again for coming on the show today. Uh, It was great to learn about the the unique things that you all are doing, right? I think that's one thing that we always get very – uh, we get too comfortable with what's out there, right? And you expect something to always taste the same or, you know, you have these minute differences by some of the big guys. But, you know, when you talk to somebody that wants to take a, a hard left and try to bring out something that is completely unique and allows you to maybe put something out during a tasting or during a blind tasting and say, what do you think of this, right? And it gives that it gives that ability to people to start opening their eyes to seeing, you know, there are there are other things out there, right? That you can drive away some of the taste buds that there's there's you're not gonna expect the same thing every time. So I think it was uh really cool and kind of seeing how you are are progressing as well as the products you're putting out. Uh, you know, I I kind of want to try that artisanal spirit now that you talked about it earlier, like see what this is all about. So but again, thank you for coming on the show today. I really appreciate the time and uh, giving a voice to craft and uh, hats off to everybody. Hope everyone has a wonderful holiday. Well, good deal. So if you like what you hear, make sure you subscribe to us on iTunes. You can also support the show by going to patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash bourbon pursuit. All of our recordings that we do on Hangouts are always available to our supporters so they can actually join in and come and ask questions and make sure not only just uh, follow Mississippi River Distilling on all those great social media channels, but you can follow us as well. Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at bourbon pursuit. And with that, we will see you all next week. Mm-hmm.